presentation. Great work, and are we all set? We are. Okay. Um, good morning, and thank you for joining the New England Nursing Home Quality Care Collaborative. I'm going to take uh, just a few minutes to review some housekeeping items before introducing um, the folks from Maine Veterans Home and Maine CDC, Massachusetts Public Health, and um, Rhode Island Health uh, to bring us into uh, the webinar on antibiotic stewardship. Um, this webinar will be recorded and the presentation will be available within a few business days. The phone lines will be on mute for the duration of the presentation and we ask that you please do not put your line on hold. If you have um, any questions at any point throughout the presentation, uh, please enter it into chat panels to the right of your screen and we will be monitoring that and responding and we will have time at the end of the presentation to respond to those questions. Um, if you find that the presentation is cut off in any way, please use the plus or minus icon in the top right of the presentation window to adjust your screen accordingly. Um, so here we um, just identify some of the ways that the QIO um, are able to support you as providers. We offer technical support for uh, the new rules of simplification and implementation. We have monthly affinity groups and QACI calls, long-term care stakeholder collaboration, virtual educational webinars, details, and subject matter experts, um, as this is. Quarterly data reports to track progress and patient and family advisory council meetings. Again, if you have any questions, uh, please don't hesitate to put those in chat and they will respond at the end of the presentation. So this is Be Prepared Designing an Antibiotic Stewardship Program. Uh, beginning in November 2017, CMS will require nursing homes to have an antibiotic stewardship program in place as part of the nationwide initiative to improve the care and safety of residents through the revised rules of participation. In today's webinar, we will showcase the work of Maine Veterans Homes through the implementation of the Antibiotic Stewardship Program. You will hear from their leadership team who will discuss how to collaborate with their farm and vets and pharmacy reps to be able to develop such a program. In addition, Maine Veterans Home will share how they track and monitor antibiotic use and subscribing and their current policies, which specifically describes exactly how their facility met the antibiotic core elements for this CMS requirement. In addition, we have included members from the main Centers for Disease Control, Massachusetts Department of Public Health and Rhode Island Department of Health, to discuss the rationale behind the need for antibiotic stewardship focus. And we're going to begin with Brittany Roy, who is the Healthcare Associated Infection Specialist and Pharmacist Jennifer Leia, who is the Antibiotic Resistance Coordinator from the main Center for Disease Control and Prevention, and they're going to review antibiotic stewardship efforts in long-term care. Thank you, Danielle. My name is Ben Lau. I'm the antibiotic resistance coordinator at the main CDC. Today, I'm joined in person by my colleague, Brittany Roy, and on the phone with Eileen McHale of Massachusetts and Emily Kluber of Rhode Island. Over the next 15 or so minutes, we will be focusing on public health perspective in terms of the new rules of participation as mandated by CMS, and antimicrobial or antibiotic stewardship, which I may be referring to as AMS. <clears throat> like many of you on this call today, we have been hard at work in anticipation of the infection control related to participation. The first major update to these regulations in over 25 years. To simplify this transition, CMS is rolling out new requirements in three phases. Phase one requirements were anticipated to be implemented in all nursing homes by November 28th of 2016. And as Danielle mentioned earlier, phase two implementation date is coming up this November 28th with antimicrobial stewardship being a major focus. Today, we will be going over CDC's IPAR tool, which is considered a gold standard of infection control. We found that the pilot infection control worksheet released by CMS earlier this summer closely resembles the IPAR worksheet and while we do not have specific guidance yet, we anticipate surveyors will be looking at the same as not very similar elements of an ICAR worksheet. Um, to assess your facility compliance to the new rules of participation. 
Brittany, Eileen, and Emily will be going over ICAR a little more closely later on in this presentation. But for now, I will quickly go over AMS and why it's particularly important in the nursing home setting. So what is antibiotic stewardship? According to the CDC, it refers to a set of commitments and activities designed to optimize treatment of infections while reducing adverse uh, events associated with antibiotic use. Um, so if you have been tasked to develop an antimicrobial stewardship team or program, you may be wondering, where do I start with AMS? I usually refer to these individuals to so what is depicted on the right. This is the CDC core elements of antimicrobial stewardship program for long-term care facilities checklist. The basic components of successful AMS programs are outlined by the seven core elements, which are leadership commitment, accountability, drug expertise, action, tracking, reporting, and education. These core elements can be used as a guide to identify specific actions that can be taken. Please note you do not have to check off every single box on the checklist to meet core elements or even establish AMS at your facility. Think of the checklist as more of a guide than a set of requirements. Focus instead on what would benefit your facility the most based on your patient's population or gaps identified from the checklist. Being best home, we'll be discussing the core elements in more detail later on. Specific to how they use the checklist as a guide to implement an antimicrobial stewardship program across their facilities. So why do we need AMS in nursing homes? There are over 4 million nursing home residents in the United States, and CDC estimates up to 70% of these residents receive at least one course of antibiotics a year. Anywhere from 40 to 75% of these antibiotics are prescribed incorrectly. Inappropriate antibiotic exposure, including inappropriate indication, excessive duration, or spectrum, which is the ability of a bug or organism to be susceptible to a particular drug, not only puts patients at risk of significant drug interactions and adverse effects caused by antibiotics, but also antibiotic use, especially if broad in spectrum or activity, disrupts helping gut bacteria and increases the risk of inspiring a secondary infection like venous acetyl or a subsequent antibiotic-resistant infection that may render previously used antibiotics ineffective for treatment. These two infection types can cause significant morbidity and may even lead to death. Um, since nursing homes are well-known risk, since nursing homes are well-known reservoirs for multi-drug resistant organisms, commonly referred to as MDROs, and nursing home residents on average have multiple comorbidities and significant amounts of previous health care, as well as potentially antibiotic exposure, Nursing home residents are more likely to have received antibiotics and are at increased risk of the potential unintended consequences of antibiotic use discussed previously. Thus, antimicrobial stewardship is an intervention that can improve antibiotic prescribing at your facility, reduce the incidence of re resistant organisms locally, thus preserving the effects of existing antibiotics within your institution for the future, and improve both quality of life and clinical outcomes for residents in your facility. Ultimately, AMS is a patient safety and public health issue. It is anticipated that the quality of care in all nursing homes in the United States will greatly improve with antimicrobial stewardship as a new infection control requirement. Hello, my name is Brittany Roy, and I'm a healthcare associate infection specialist at the Maine CDC, and I've been working on the ICAR program in the long term care setting. The ICAR program originated in response to gaps identified in infection control domestically during the international Ebola outbreak. The ICAR acronym stands for Infection Control Assessment and Response. This program is CDC sponsored and state departments of health receive federal funds to conduct these assessments. The program assists departments of health to assess infection prevention practices and to guide quality improvement. The assessment usually consists of an on-site visit and a questionnaire is used to look at infection control strength and any gaps that may exist. The process is non-regulatory and is meant to be an educational opportunity, and the best part is that there is no cost associated with having this assessment. The long-term care assessment tool is available at the link at the bottom of the slide, and there are tools available for other healthcare settings as well, including acute care, outpatient, and hemodialysis. And I also want to mention that the iPad tool aligns nicely with the new infection control requirements. So if you're interested in having an assessment, you can contact your state health department or look at the tool available on the link. The ICAR goals are to strengthen relationships and build collaborations between state health departments and healthcare partners, 
to assist healthcare facilities to assess their infection control programs and identify strengths along with areas for improvement, and to provide resources to address any gaps identified. At the State Health Department, we use this information from the assessment to identify infection control training and education programs to address the needs of healthcare facilities. Here are the different sections that are included on the long-term care ICAR assessment. As you can see, many infection control topics are included on the assessment tool, including antibiotic stewardship. This table highlights a few of the results from the ICAR assessments conducted in different New England states, including Maine, Massachusetts, and Rhode Island. I would like to note that for the percent of facilities with a trained infection prevention inspection towards the middle of the table, it is not been clearly identified what constitutes official training by CMS at this point. Therefore, each health department has interpreted this a little differently. In Maine, we released an online training and conducted in-person training during the ICAR period, which reflects a higher number in our section. However, we are still waiting on clarification on exactly what type of training is accessible. This is not a requirement until November of 2019. I would also like to highlight the new staff hours per week dedicated to infection prevention practice inspection towards the bottom of the table. There has not been any specific information released that addresses the appropriate number of hours. The regulations state each facility must complete their risk assessment to determine the amount of time that is appropriate for their specific facility. Given the additional regulations and the fact that many ITs are working in some capacity on antibiotic stewardship, this assessment would be important to complete to assess if the current time allotted is sufficient. This table shows a summary of the national data from 289 facilities with assessments completed by 32 different health departments. As you may notice, antibiotic stewardship is one of the sections with the most gaps. This is not surprising because programs are not required until 2017, and we are hoping that the trainings like this one you are attending today will help you to meet that requirement. Each health department will now present state-specific information. For the main section, we will not go into specific ICAR data results for the sake of time, but we are hoping to release a summary report and have a statewide webinar to go over this in the coming months. So, main facilities, stay tuned for more information. As far as HAI actions for the assessment facilities, each ICAR facility was provided with a binder containing many infection control resources that accompany an online training, along with a GoDrain kit to assist with environmental cleaning auditing. Every facility also received a summary report after the assessment with resources to address any gaps identified. And I also want to note that the binders are available to anyone, any main facility that completes the online training as well. They can be mailed to you or you can receive an electronic version. At the state level, a free online infection control training was made available to all long-term care facilities thanks to the work of the University of Southern Maine and the Maine Quality Forum. We also conducted in-person trainings in four areas throughout the state. In addition, we added a new section to our website with resources for infection preventionists that breaks down resources by each ICAR topic, and this is available for facilities that are not in the state of Maine as well, so feel free to use the link. Data was presented through various formats to stakeholders, including through newsletters and in-person presentations, and we have future plans to release the data more broadly. Finally, we purchased APEC long-term care IT guides for every nursing home in the state and are working on getting them all delivered. My colleagues and I will now finish up the main section with statewide antibiotic stewardship data. Thank you, Brittany. Prior to the actions Brittany just discussed, we conducted an online survey to assess where main facilities are with each of CDC's core elements. Out of 103 facilities in Maine, 68 of them responded, and we found that 28% of these facilities met all seven core elements in 2016. We were particularly impressed by this figure as we had not yet conducted many actions to support main facilities in antimicrobial stewardship. We will be releasing another survey after the phase two implementation date to assess where facilities are as far as AMS goes, so please stay tuned for that. And here's our contact information if any questions regarding antibiotic stewardship come up or if you're interested in doing an ICAR assessment um, with us, please get in touch. Thank you. And now we will have our colleague in Massachusetts, Arlene McHale, present on their ICAR report. Hi, Eileen. Make 
sure you press pound six to unmute your line, and, and make sure you don't also have the mute button on your phone muted. I think I should be all set now. Can anybody hear? We can hear Great. you now. Go ahead. Very good. Hi. Uh, thank you very much. Really nice work um, that Maine is able to share. Very, um, I'm very uh, impressed with what I just heard. So I'm going to just share a little bit about um, some of the work that we are doing here in Massachusetts. And my book is really is on the ICAR assessments and um, stating that because I spoke to Massachusetts who happen to be on the line. just want to make sure that people know that we, this is an ongoing initiative that we'll be completing. Um, we'll be, we're still looking for people, for volunteers to um, uh, request our, um, an ICAR visit. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about some of the results. And uh, from the previous slide, you saw that we've done in the, in the range of about 50 ICAR assessments. And the results from sharing are just based on 31 of those that have had an assessment. And so this slide shows what are some of the strengths that we've seen in our, set, our settings of long-term care. And one of the things that we've seen is that um, all of the long-term care facilities who have um, had an ICAR assessment have identified a specific person who's responsible for coordinating the infection control program. Um, that being said, we did see that the mean number of um, uh, dedicated hours to this is eight, with a minimum of two hours per week and a maximum of 12 hours per week. Um, I think that the important thing that we know here is that no, um, it's not new to anybody on the line is that folks in long-term care who usually have multiple hats. Um, second bullet here, you can see that um, the, the policies and procedures that are in place for infection control are evidence-based. Ninety-four percent of the sites that were visited, but we did, you know, in reviewing even those policies and procedures, we did see that um, sixty-one percent of those didn't have have not had an annual review. So we're, we pointed that out and provided some guidance for facilities regarding that. Um, very important and very, you know, good results that we're seeing is that the plans and systems for surveillance and disease reporting are in place in 85 to 100 percent of those facilities that have uh, had an ICAR assessment. Uh, and the PPE use um, and the supplies for PPE use, safe injection practices, and cleaning and disinfection procedures are very readily available in 90 to 94 percent of our sites. So this slide just identifies the areas where some improvement um, is needed, where some of the gaps we're seeing. And I think that first bullet here is, um, as you heard from uh, State of Maine, uh, no formal infection control training is uh, not in place in 84 percent of the sites that were visited. Um, another finding is that um, uh, hand hygiene policies uh, do not promote uh, alcohol-based hand rub in 52 percent of the sites seen. And less than 50% uh, of long-term care facilities are performing routine audit audits to monitor and document adherence to PPE use and safe injection practices. Um, the second to last bullet, um, as already been stated, uh, antibiotic stewardship programs are not fully implemented at most long-term care facilities, and that's something that we expected to see. We know that this is a, a daunting um, initiative for folks in long-term care, so we didn't expect to see full implementation. Um, last bullet here for quantity use. I think that what we're seeing, 48% uh, of those sites that were um, did have an ITAR is that the wet time or the wrong solution was used to clean and disinfect the meters. So, uh, next slide. So, all right, so long-term care is the post audit uh, assessment feedback at the time of our assessments at the end of the day. Our staff is sitting down with those with as many staff as we can gather on site and we follow up with the detailed site report, summarizing the findings and providing some recommendations for the gaps that were identified. We're in the process of soon um, the, uh, 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 supplying a uh, resource finder, similar to what we saw from our colleagues in uh, Maine, and some examples of things that will be in the binder of signage, score hand and respiratory hygiene, competency validation forms, and so on, uh, with links to some of the uh, specific guidelines for infection control and long-term care. Uh, setting sites that have already had this assessment and didn't receive a binder, everybody said we'll all receive one. And we are planning for a brief check in six months after the assessment to just check in, see, you know, where, what kind of progress is made, where uh, additional information is necessary, and how much additional support we're able to, to supply. Next slide. 
some very important information here. We're still um, actively looking for volunteers who are interested in participating. Uh, again, to restate what's already been um, discussed, these are non-regulatory. These are consultative um, uh, visits, no cost to the facility. Um, the funding is, is been supplied by the Center for Disease Control, and that will be ending in March of 2018. We're so. Um, would let you like you to uh, those folks from Massachusetts contact as soon as possible so we can schedule this uh, visit for you. Just to talk uh, very briefly about some of the what's happening for in Massachusetts uh, long-term care um, antibiotic stewardship. Um, we're very grateful to be able to partner with health um, health centric advisors. We've been uh, an outstanding partner. We um, we provided a six-part webinar series. I'm sure many of you folks um, were on the calls, those calls. Um, this is available to all of the New England states. Um, this, these were intended to provide, you know, long-term care facilities and strategies and tools to develop stewardship programs. Um, we also discussed a wide variety of long-term care needs, um, you know, stewardship 101, um, urinary tract infections, particularly asymptomatic bacteria, uh, folks on C. diff, uh, antibiotic use, monitoring, and de-escalation. Uh, Dr. Sheila Jerome and uh, Kira Bolex, PharmD, some Pest Medical Center uh, subject matter experts for work, work. They provided those webinars. Um, we're planning now for some additional education for the setting of long-term care, and uh, we we'll hope to continue partnering with health centers. Uh, in addition to that, we uh, provided a microbial stewardship program that we passed the care continuum. We uh, back in May, we had 120 participants from both the acute care setting as well as long-term care. We provide CME, um, there was a CME program. Um, you know, we stress the four elements of stewardship for both settings of care and provide tools and resources. Um, it's the additional thing we're doing is, you know, stewardship-related. We're working with the uh, health center advisors. We enrolled to, to assist in the, enrolling 62 long-term care facilities in the Centers for Disease Control National Health Care Safety Network and to begin reporting to the facility. Um, we have plans for the uh, this for coming years, and we hope to enroll an additional 50 long-term care facilities in NHSN in order to get an understanding of the burden in, in this setting. Um, again, people, if you would reach out to me directly if you're interested um, in having an ICAR visit or if you have any other questions in regards to um, HAI prevention in the setting of long-term care. I'll turn things over to Rhode Island. All right. Can everybody hear me? We can hear you, but you're a little faint. I don't know if you can get closer to the phone or maybe speak a little louder. Let's see. Is that better? That's better. Thank you. All right. Um, well, thank you for the opportunity to share some Rhode Island information on this webinar. Uh, you're a small, small neighbor to the, to the south and north. Um, uh, so, as you can see, Rhode Island is a, is a smaller state. We have fewer facilities um, that present some, you know, unique opportunities and challenges that we've been working to address across facility settings. Um, but it's uh, a great opportunity to improve communication and collaboration. So, if you can, next slide. Uh, so, for Rhode Island, what we did with our ICARs is we focused on the nursing facilities that are participating in the Twin QIO CDI project, which Eileen mentioned is um, one of the components is getting folks registered and submitting data to the National Healthcare Safety Network, uh, specifically CDI for the nursing homes. Um, prior to doing our on-site ICAR assessments, we actually gave all facilities the opportunity to complete the ICAR tool as a self-assessment. Our goal was to collect as much information as possible to get as wide of a view as we could. Um, we also wanted to sort of get a sense of where people thought they were. Um, and then we went and we did 15 on-site ICAR assessments. Um, what I can say is that there was a little variation between what folks did in the self-assessment and the results we saw when we had our experts go out and, and do the assessments on-site. Um, and I would absolutely... Um, to, to give a, do a shout out for Eileen, um, any facility that is interested in having an on-site ICAR, all of the facilities that we've worked with found it to be extremely helpful um, and extremely informative. But for facilities that don't have that opportunity, I would strongly encourage you to at least look at the ICAR tool and use that as sort of a, um, a guide to where you might want to focus your efforts and how you might want to work on expanding your programs. 
Um, so like I said, the on-site ICAR opportunity was great for our facilities. It provided a lot of opportunity for just-in-time education. Um, we had Janet Robinson going out. She's been working in infection prevention and long-term care for many years. Um, so it was a great opportunity for her to go out and sort of work with the facilities and um, help them understand, you know, where they're where they are, where they're doing well, and, and where they need to focus their efforts in the future. Um, we provided each of those facilities with a copy of the 2017 Long-Term Care Facility Training Resource Manual from NHSN, um, because as I said, those are the facilities who are participating in the CDI NHSN project. Uh, next slide. Um, so this is some of our ICAR data. Given the topic today, I focus on the antibiotic stewardship information from the ICAR. Um, I just wanted to call out a few interesting things that we learned. Um, if you look at the table on your screen, what you'll see is um, almost all the facilities had um, leadership support for antibiotic stewardship efforts. They had identified individuals within their facilities that were accountable for leading these efforts. But they really um, are struggling to get access to antibiotic prescribing expertise, um, which specifically means an infectious disease trained physician or pharmacist. Um, I do know that some of the pharmacy um, consulting organizations nationally are working on programs to better meet this need, um, but in the meantime, there is sort of a lack of that expertise. Um, so it is, it is great to see how many facilities have really gotten on board and are really working in this direction. Um, and again, the facility is having written policies on antibiotic prescribing, um, and I think that's really just indicative of the fact that they are lacking access to those those experts. Um, so I do anticipate that that will be coming down the line. Uh, next slide. Oh, perfect. Um, so as you can see, uh, the facilities, uh, um, almost all of them have a report summarizing their antibiotic use from pharmacy data. Um, they also have reports summarizing their antibiotic resistance. Um, all of them are getting antibiograms from the labs that they use in the state. Um, but where we're again seeing sort of a, a gap is translating that information to the prescribers. Um, so making sure that that information is being shared back with folks who are writing those prescriptions. Um, and sort of on a similar note, what we saw was um, significant numbers of facilities have begun training their nursing staff on antibiotic use and stewardship, but that hadn't quite reached the clinical prescribers with prescribing privileges in the same in the same way. Um, so, you know, and this is sort of indicative of the other areas of the ICAR that we saw where, you know, there's there's a lot of interest and support in expanding these activities, but I think there's a, a lack of resources, whether that person time, um, you know, as was mentioned by a previous speaker, and a lot of these facilities, well, they do have somebody who's designated to lead infection prevention or designated to lead, lead into microbial stewardship, that person likely has three or four other competing priorities and hats that they have to wear on a daily basis. Um, and I think as we move towards the rest of the regulations being rolled out over the next year and a half or so, um, I think we'll see that change and I think that it's going to be a bit of a, a, a tide change um, for facilities to really truly dedicate a specific person and a significant amount of that person's time to these activities. Um, but I think they've, a lot of them have set the stage well, and I think that they're interested in, in incorporating these activities, and it'll, um, I think it will happen. Uh, next slide. So some of the AGI activities that we've been working on statewide, um, one of the things that we identified across the board with our ICAR activities um, was a, a lack of training available. Um, so for the hospitals, you know, the IT staff had significant training and education expertise, but their data, their, their direct care staff, um, it was difficult to train all of those people. And in the nursing homes, um, as we've seen in other states, you know, they had identified a specific person to lead their infection prevention program, but that person didn't necessarily have specific education or training. Um, so, you know, as was mentioned previously, uh, the training component of the regulations does go into effect in November 2019. Obviously, that's not going to be something necessarily that can be completed a week or two in advance of that going into effect. So I know that many states around the country have been working on ways to help their facilities meet this requirement, and we are still waiting on the specific guidance as to what type of training will meet that requirement. Um, 
But one of the things that we felt was important right off the bat was helping people to understand the regulations that they that relate to infection prevention and what they were going to be responsible for. So we developed a six-part training series that was led by Janet Robinson that walks facilities through the components of an infection prevention program and long-term care um, and what they'll need to do to be ready for those requirements. Uh, it's a great program. It's very informative. What we're calling it is our jumpstart training. So we don't anticipate that that will meet the requirement, but it's really excellent for anybody who's new to the role in, of infection prevention and wants to understand sort of what that role entails and a little bit of a preview of what they would get from training, um, a more intensive training. We have also enrolled 80 long-term care health providers in the ACA infection prevention training. Um, so that is a self-directed web-based training. Um, it's about 20 hours, I believe, of training. Um, Again, we don't know that that specifically, specifically will meet the requirements, but we do anticipate that um, that it will hit on all the major topics that will have to be included. Um, so we have representatives from 59 of our skilled nursing facilities out of the 84 in the state. They also have somebody from our um, veterans home, somebody from one of our corporate nursing homes, and somebody um, from our lab, and somebody from one of the consulting organizations in the state. Um, so of the 80 folks, um, we've had about five people finish. It's been very well received, um, and we're happy to be able to provide that opportunity in Rhode Island. Um, we've also, over the past year and a half or so, been developing what we call our API Prevention and Antimicrobial Stewardship Coalition. This is a coalition in Rhode Island where we're really working to bring together um, healthcare providers from across settings and across disciplines so across the spectrum of care, bringing the infection prevention, the pharmacy stewardship, um, leadership, um, all together to really sort of work on these topics together. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, we're a small state, so every time somebody comes out with a new project, um, we're also scrambling to see who gets to work with who. Um, so this is also an opportunity for us to better coordinate all the different opportunities in the state and make sure that all of our facilities are benefiting um, as much as they can from the things that are available to them. Um, we also created an online resource hub. You'll see the website on your screen. Um, it's something that we put together in the state. It's all existing resources and tools, but rather than having people, you know, go from website to website searching for best practices, tool tips, et cetera, um, we put them all in one place, and folks can look at them um, by facility setting and also by subject. Um, so it's a, a great resource. and. We're happy to have folks from any state look at that. And the uh, six-part training series is also available to anybody who's interested. Um, some of the information is somewhat Rhode Island specific, but uh, most of it would be uh, helpful for folks from any state. And uh, I believe the link is within the website that you see on your screen, but if anybody has difficulty finding that series, uh, feel free to email me, and I'd be happy to get you set up on that. Uh, so my information is here. I've also included Janet Robinson's information. She leads that six-part training, and she's also one of the faculty for the ACA training. So I will now hand it back to Danielle to get you started with our speakers from the VA. Thank you, ladies. Are we back live? <laughs> yep, we got you. Okay, great. Thank you so much um, for all three states' contribution and, and kind of historical perspectives and current updates on the work that you've been doing. We'd like to take this time now to turn it over to the folks at, of Maine Veterans Home, uh, who will be describing their efforts in the development of the antibiotic stewardship program. Um, we have three presenters today. Uh, Donna Baker, who is the manager of clinical system support. Um, and Neil Thur Thurlow, um, a pharmacist and the assistant director for the pharmacies, and Rob Carter, who is the pharmacy business manager, uh, business office manager for, um, and a member of the Antibiotic Stewardship Team. So I'm going to turn it over to Donna uh, to take it away. Thank you, Danielle. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to join me today to talk about the Veterans Home's work on antibiotic stewardship. Uh, today, my colleagues um, from the pharmacy and I will be discussing how we approach the development of our organization's antibiotic stewardship program in response to CMS's regulatory requirements. So, in looking at how our journey began, 
when we learned of the upcoming requirements of the Maine Graduate Stewardship Program, we looked a lot like the woman on the slide that you see here pulling her hair out. Um, like some of you uh, may have also felt a little bit overwhelmed with all of the recent regulatory changes that have impacted our industry. Uh, when we heard about two not to be in about stewardship requirements, we really had to take a deep breath and approach it as a few and one step at a time. We began to look at, at our, our infection control program and our practices, uh, particularly in respect to in stewardship. For the initial steps, uh, we, we started by discussing and really gaining an understanding of the core concepts and elements of antibiotic stewardship. Um, we use the CDC guidance and checklist, which you can find on the CDC website, and the link is also included on the slide for you at the bottom. The CDC checklist, uh, CDC checklist was extremely helpful for us in order to approach this in a thorough and systematic fashion. The checklist helped guide us through the development of the baseline assessment, we helped establish uh, facility practice guidelines and the development of our education programs and policies all in regard to the antibiotic stewardship program. The checklist of the core elements of antibiotic stewardship and nursing homes, uh, again, was very helpful and it addresses key areas in order for you to establish a baseline assessment of your facility policies and practices. After establishing a baseline assessment, uh, the tool should also be used ongoing to measure your organization's progress. I'll address each of the uh, categories in, in more detail in just a moment, um, but in looking at the main uh, categories, we have the core elements include leadership support, accountability, blood expertise, and action to improve use. Also, tracking, um, which is consists of uh, monitoring antibiotic prescribing and use and resistance. Reporting information to staff on improving antibiotic use and resistance. And then finally, education. So now we will look more closely um, at each component. And can I see that hand just a moment? Yes, I guess we'll see um, So now we're going to look more closely uh, at each component and the questions asked on the checklist. Treatment of checklist slide. Open up those technical. Yeah, right there. Okay. <laughs> So again, now we're going to look more closely at each of the components on the checklist, and I'll also share a little bit of what we've done to meet those requirements at Maine Veterans Home. And I think also these things keep us in mind that we've been working on this for quite some time now, uh, almost two years, and so we didn't do everything all at once, and we don't necessarily have to do everything that's mentioned on the checklist, but it does give you some idea and direction on types of things that you should consider. Wherever you develop it, it certainly has to be tailored realistically to what your home can do based on your structure and the resources available to you. So the first uh, category is uh, regarding leadership support. And so in this, uh, they, the question asks, if your facility can demonstrate leadership support for antibiotic stewardship, so one or more uh, actions, and these actions could include a written statement of leadership support to improve antibiotic use, incorporating antibiotic stewardship duties from the medical director and or the director of nursing and drug prescription, leadership monitoring of whether antibiotic stewardship policies are followed, and review of antibiotic use and resistance data in quality assurance meetings. At Maine Veterans Home, uh, we developed a written statement to establish a leadership commitment and we put an addendum in our infection control manual. Our policy also clearly states our commitment to antibiotic stewardship as a priority for our organization. As we all know, leadership by and, and support is key building foundation and success of the program. The antibiotic stewardship program expectations in our uh, facilities were discussed uh, first with our leadership staff and our quality improvement committees at both the facility and the corporate level. And those uh, quality improvement committees, in collaboration with the infection preventionists in each of our homes and our pharmacy, Consultants monitor adherence to the policies and practice guidance that we put forth. We also revised our medical director and our director of nursing job descriptions to include their roles and responsibilities related to the antibiotic stewardship. So, again, not everything on the checklist is required. Um, you know, because we've had more time, we've been able to incorporate uh, more than what we started with. 
Um, but just keep that in mind that it, it doesn't mean that you have to do it all. The next category is uh, regarding our accountability. The second question on the checklist asks if your facility has identified a need or needs for the antibiotic stewardship activities. This can be your medical director, director or assistant directors of nursing services, or consulting pharmacy. Uh, we included all of these roles, uh, as well as the infection preventionist. We do have an infection preventionist for each of our homes designated, and that's part of our policy. So our drug expertise, the third question on the checklist asks if the facility is individuals uh, with antibiotic stewardship expertise. This could be a consultant pharmacy that has staff training and experience in antibiotic stewardship. Some of you may be partnering with stewardship teams at your referral hospital. We've not uh, hit that yet. Or an external infectious disease or stewardship consultant. So we have a home we work in close partnership with our pharmacy and have consulted with an external infectious disease pharmacist. And the pharmacy staff has been involved in the process and team members of this effort um, right from the beginning and provided tremendous support, so we're really fortunate. Actions to improve use. Uh, this area involves actually three parts related to the policy and practice and actions to improve the antibiotic use. This piece asks whether the facility has policies in place to improve prescribers in use. For example, have you addressed written requirements for prescribers to document a drug dose, duration, and indication for all antibiotic prescriptions? Also, have you developed a facility-specific algorithm for assessing residents and facility-based algorithms for appropriate diagnostic testing, such as obtaining cultures with specific infections? It also asks if you've developed facility-specific treatment recommendations for infections and whether or not your facility does a review of antibiotic agents with some medication formulary. The third piece of this is whether or not your facility has implemented practices to improve antibiotic use. So practice examples can be activities such as utilization of a standard assessment and communication tool for residents suspected of having an infection, implementation of a process of communicating or receiving antibiotic use information with residents to transfer to or from other healthcare facilities. And that communication is uh, particularly important um, to uh, have continuity of care. Uh, it was a development of reports that summarize the antibiotic susceptibility patterns, such as facility antibiograms, implementation of an antibiotic review process with antibiotic <coughs> and or an implementation of an infection-specific intervention to improve antibiotic use for certain conditions. And then the third part of this is action to improve use. Uh, and on the checklist, it asks if your consultant pharmacist uh, supports the antibiotic stewardship activities. Activities performed by the consultant pharmacists can include things like a review of the antibiotic course for appropriateness of administration or indication, establishment of standards for clinical lab monitoring for adverse drug events for the antibiotic use, and review of microbiology culture uh, to assess and guide antibiotic selection. So in the veterans' homes, we established written prescriber requirements to include drug, dose, duration, and indication. And this is addressed in our policy. We developed assessment and treatment algorithms and provided education on each. We also tailored our electronic medical record system. Uh, the functionality now requires elements as you're writing a, a physician's order or medication. It's required that you enter the dose, the duration, and the indication. Our EMR is also customized to helpful communication to alert users when they're entering orders to obtain cultures. Report uh, and record outcomes and appropriate care planning. We also request and utilize the biograms from our partners' laboratories as well. The next piece is on tracking and monitoring antibiotic uh, prescribing use and resistance. So, this piece of the checklist addresses that uh, tracking and monitoring and asks if your facility monitors normal measures of antibiotic use. So, for example, are you tracking adherence to clinical assessment documentation with signs and symptoms, vital signs, and physical exam findings? Are you tracking adherence to prescribing documentation to ensure it includes dose duration and indication? Are you monitoring adherence to facility specific treatment recommendations? And are you performing point prevalent surveys of antibiotic use? Are you monitoring the rates of antibiotic start and antibiotic days of therapy per 1,000? So another uh, piece of, you know, did your facility monitor one or the outcomes of the antibiotic use? 
And so you should specifically describe what you're monitoring, such as the particular infection rate, uh, rates of antibiotics in different organisms, and rates of adverse drug events in antibiotics. So uh, our pharmacy will talk a little bit more in a few minutes about what we are tracking as part of antibiotics as we start um, there to date. Um, we are also uh, monitoring outcomes of antibiotics and some of the difficult rates. Um, and again, our pharmacy will discuss that shortly. And then on uh, reporting information, uh, the latter part of the checklist asks if your facility provides facility specific reports on antibiotic use and outcomes with clinical uh, providers and nursing staff. Are you tracking measures of antibiotic use of the facility, measures of outcomes related to antibiotic use, including the facility rates? Do you report facility antibiotic susceptibility patterns within the last 18 months? And do you provide personalized feedback on antibiotic prescribing practices to clinical providers? At the Veterans Homes, uh, we monitor the antibiotic use and outcomes in collaboration uh, with our pharmacy. And feedback is provided to practitioners in order to improve antibiotic use and resistance. We also uh, measure uh, the antibiotic use and outcomes, uh, and we incorporate that reporting in our swapping program. The final piece of the uh, checklist is regarding education. And on the education piece, they are asking if you, know, you provided them some resource material to uh, discuss and uh, teach others about antibiotic resistance and other opportunities for improving antibiotic use. Uh, so this would include your clinical providers, nurse and staff, including your direct care, and residents and families. And in veterans' homes, we provided education to staff, including our leadership team, residents, and families. Uh, education um, is, is certainly very important. We started with that initially, and it's something that we are looking at ongoing uh, to keep staff informed. So next, uh, this slide is, is of our performance improvement project. Uh, our team was established early on, and so this is our, what you're looking at here is our, uh, a piece of our team charter. And it describes our purpose and the scope of the team. The purpose of the antibiotic stewardship performance improvement uh, team and project is to establish and promote the use of scientific-based protocols that outline the appropriate circumstances for antimicrobial use with the goal of improving outcomes for our residents and reducing the incidences of multi-drug resistant organism infections. The scope of the antibiotic stewardship uh, team is to improve the selection, dose, and duration of antibiotic therapy and to improve outcomes for individual residents by optimizing treatment of infectious processes and minimizing the resultant complications of therapy. We also uh, outline a multidisciplinary membership uh, with roles and responsibilities as a committee member, the goals, the resources available, and a recording of data measurement plan for monitoring. We monitor nosocomial, multi-drug resistant organisms, and syndicacial infections on all residents, excluding new admissions presenting with symptoms within 72 hours of admission. And pharmacy, again, we'll be discussing a bit about the data collection on the antibiotic use shortly. For quality assurance and performance improvement, uh, there are a few things that uh, I'll address here. And, you know, as we started out, we established a regular scheduled meeting. That was one of our first um, approaches, is we just kind of all just have to get together in order to learn about and discuss uh, what we needed to do in order to tackle this. And we met very frequently initially, and then we were able to move to monthly and then as needed. So it was time intensive in, in the initial phases for us. The next uh, thing we did is we developed program goals and scheduled outcomes. And as you know, it's important to determine your facility's goals and, and what you actually expect them to be both out of your efforts in order to be able to measure the process. We also had to have a discussion. It was really helpful for us. Um, we need to make sure that we were all on the same page. And so we discussed some standardization of the reporting process, definitions. You know, and that way you're looking at accurate data and have some consistency across the board. As I mentioned, you have, or I may not have, we have six homes. And so we needed to make sure that we were all um, accurately reporting in the same way. 
We also incorporate a bit of our stewardship monitoring into our organization, while we recording the following uh, assurance uh, program, and we share and communicate our progress with uh, staff and practitioners and residents and families, and that certainly helps us uh, to keep the momentum going and keep the issue on the forefront. And the last piece of this slide uh, is our approach with the plan to check match model, uh, which has been very helpful. It's important to really look at the progress and impact of the working efforts. Um, and also remember to incorporate the checklist ongoing uh, as you look at your progress in your home. This is our actual policy, so I'll, I'll try to run through this. Um, our actual policy here at the Freshman Homes uh, incorporates a lot of things that I've already discussed. Uh, our policy is that Maine Veterans Homes will implement an antibiotic stewardship program based on the Center of Disease Control's core elements of antibiotic stewardship for nursing homes. The effectiveness of the program will be evaluated annually during our infection control program review. And our purpose is to improve patient safety and assist in prevention of multi drug resistant organisms and clostridium difficile infections. By optimizing the use of antibiotic drugs and to provide continuous improvement by utilizing prescribing and outcomes data to identify opportunities for targeted initiatives and optimal antibiotic prescribing. So the remainder is our procedure, and this really gets into uh, describing the role of the infectious disease and pharmacy services, which includes for us a board certified pharmacotherapy uh, specialist and IV trained consultant pharmacist, clinical review of antibiotic prescriptions, and tracking and training for appropriate antibiotic selection and indication. Our pharmacists do provide the drug expertise for the antibiotic stewardship program. And we also have a contracted infectious disease trend consultant pharmacist who provides support and consultation uh, for our program. In the main members' home policy and procedures on medication orders um, that the pharmacy has, uh, it does require us to include our practitioners to include seven elements in medication ordering, including the dose and duration of the medication. Our pharmacy also provides consultation and guidance to physicians on appropriate antibiotic selection, dosing and duration of therapy based on culture report, antibiogram, and current evidence-based guidelines as requested. We also uh, assess residents prior to admission or transfer or discharge for infectious disease status. Uh, information is also communicated to the infection preventionist. Uh, we have uh, tools within our EMR that also help uh, communication and automatic alerts to happen as well. In our homes, the nurse uh, manager or, or whomever they designate uh, will review culture reports and address issues with providers as needed. Our pharmacy also provides monthly feedback reports to us um, for, for providers for um, prescribing practice to the facilities. Organizational approved protocols, like uh, those are available um, in the top of those algorithms. Each facility also has an infection preventionist designated, as I mentioned, and they are responsible for coordinating the uh, stewardship activities along with the team. And administration reports um, supports this program effort uh, by establishing the uh, stewardship as an organizational priority and ensure that each facility has a designated infection prevention person and that they're reporting data to our quality, um, our teams in, in the uh, facility level as well as the corporate level. And our medical directors and directors of nursing services and residential care directors uh, all work collaboratively in an effort to promote antibiotics to achieve. And the uh, infection preventionist does observe and assess trends uh, in collaboration with pharmacy to antibiotic use or antibiotic use. We, as I mentioned, results are tracked, trended, and reported and are clocking. Uh, to measure outcomes, we monitor facility antibiotic usage for a thousand resident days. And uh, I think I mentioned we had started uh, focused on urinary tract infections and then opened that up to other infections. Uh, and again, those are recorded at our quality. And activity is a monitoring completed by the infectious preventionist and the pharmacy regarding the antibiotic stewardship is also recorded at the monthly infection control committee um, in addition to quality. 
So pharmacy and collaboration with the infection preventionists also provide ongoing education to clinical staff and providers regarding antibiotic stewardship. Educational information and materials are provided to our residents prior to their admission to our facility. And so for accountability at the uh, end of the policy, the medical directors in collaboration with the directors of nursing and the residential care uh, directors and infection preventionists are all responsible for the antibiotic stewardship program. And again, we, we look at this on an annual basis to really look at our progress and evaluate the effectiveness uh, and, of course, tweak it as necessary given the findings. So next is specialized education for key staff. As I mentioned, we have an infection preventionist that is needed in each of our facilities. And uh, this is mostly our staff development coordinators, coordinators in each of our homes, and they also oversee our infection control. Uh, depending on your structure, you may have another role assigned to this. The infection prevention training is offered through American Healthcare Association and the National Center for Assistive Living, and the infection prevention and specialized training link is included on this slide for you. Yeah. So, staff education, um, when we looked at staff education, uh, we included um, two components here that I'll review quickly. Um, we had uh, education for clinicians, our staff, and our residents and families. Uh, and it's, you know, it's, it was really critical for us um, to provide that education uh, to promote the success of our program. Education was provided to our staff really early on, and, and again, it just continues, particularly as we change and, and move forward with our program. The main objectives that we covered for our staff are what do you mean by an antibiotic stewardship? Why is this issue even important to us? We also provide an overview of the performance improvement project that we reviewed, so everyone was aware of what we were doing and why we were doing it. And we included the introduction of the key players um, in the timeline uh, for implementation to our staff. Then for residents and family education, we utilize the Get Smart brochure from the CDC. Uh, this is very helpful for residents and families to understand in layman terms when antibiotics are appropriate, and that they're not to be used for viruses like the common cold or flu. As we all know, there's a gross and significant lack of understanding among the general population about when antibiotics are to be used. So this brochure could be very helpful to educate residents and families on what to expect. And I've included the link to that uh, brochure on the bottom of the slide as well. So we definitely encountered some challenges throughout our journey. Uh, to, you know, one of which was getting everyone on board, and I'm talking about medical directors, physicians, nursing staff, residents, and families. This is particularly challenging because of the learning practices and beliefs. Education on antibiotic stewardship and why it's important is critical and requires ongoing effort and planning to stay current and effective. Narrowing down the focus, again, as I mentioned in the beginning, we were certainly overwhelmed uh, given all of the changes um, that are happening in the industry right now that we're you know, all needing to sort of keep up with and comply. Uh, we began with an initial focus just on urinary tract infections, as I mentioned, and then we later expanded to include all infection types. Uh, for a suggestion, you know, several of you um, may be well underway with this program by now, um, but our advice is really take it step by step. Um, tackling too much at once can set you up for failure. Um, so, you know, do it in a realistic um, pace. Standardization of definitions and practice and measures. Uh, as I mentioned, we have six facilities, and we needed to really be sure that we were understanding everything in the same way. Um, so, we wanted to be sure that we were all using best practices consistently and uh, measuring data and outcomes in the same way. Long-term care benchmarks. Uh, as we began working on the antibiotic stewardship program, we realized there was a real lack of nursing home models and benchmarks to compare ourselves to. So we found a lot of gear toward the acute care hospitals. So now, as we move closer to implementation date, and everyone start, you know, beginning to um, really uh, look at this and, and become in compliance, we hope to see more information. Time, funding, and resources. Uh, those are definite challenges. Uh, especially as we're faced with so many regulatory changes and initiatives right now, it can be really hard to keep up. So, utilizing resources was it. Changing practice is another tough challenge. Uh, old practice habits, such as in continuing to treat UTI due to behaviors only. 
food system addressing, uh, education and monitoring. Biting into new ideas. This is a continued effort in education to help change the culture in the organization. Certainly. And staff turnover can also inhibit or slow our progress. Good education from the start of employment and ongoing is necessary to keep the momentum. So next, our uh, pharmacy, you'll hear about our uh, way that the pharmacist has been tracking some of the information and their participation in the antibiotic stewardship program. So I'll turn it over to Neil. Neil for a moment. Thanks, Don. Um, as part of being better in home, and stage pharmacy, partnered, partnered with nursing across all of our homes to develop our antibiotic stewardship program. Our goal was to bring medication-specific expertise to this critical initiative. The overall strategy is to collaborate with nursing, physicians, and their extenders to optimize antibiotic therapy. We support this in three key areas. Integral to the program, we developed and provided education to all staff. We also led the way in order to support CQI in regards to data generation, development, and review at a corporate QAPF. We optimize therapy through treatment algorithms and medication de-escalation, which we'll discuss in a later section. Each of these criteria is an essential aspect of the success of our antibiotic stewardship program for our organization. We contracted with Dr. Parrick, who was a certified infectious disease pharmacist, who had experience with developing antibiotic stewardship programs. He is currently employed at Harvard University's Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston. Dr. Parrick was instrumental in helping us develop our UPI treatment algorithm, which has created a standard for the program. We started with use data because this is a common infection in the geriatric population and the treatment in relative terms can be considered more streamlined compared to other infections. Also, the lab data is relatively efficient to utilize. We'll, we will review the algorithm on the next slide. However, I wanted to briefly touch on training. We are in Maine, and our homes are relatively spread out across a large state. Using technology such as webinars and electronic training is an important way to reach all staff. As in the case in most settings of health care, there are multiple specialties, shifts, and staffing requirements. Being able to utilize technology helps our efficiency in training all of our staff is an important aspect to consider. I apologize as this is a big slide. However, the algorithm, the algorithm has, a very specific, has very specific details in assessing a possible UTI infection. Additionally, it was designed to foster a true interdisciplinary approach to treatment success. This, this encompasses all steps from nursing assessment, prescriber diagnosis, and medication selection. This aspect took a great deal of coordination between private specialties, and we uh, feel the value is a more efficient diagnosis and treatment. In later stages, I will go over the de-escalation opportunities and its impact on patient care. For now, I will turn it over to my colleague, Rob Potter, who will discuss the important aspect of antibiotic stewardship, organizing that. Thank you, Neil. How can pharmacy assist with data? <clears throat> a pharmacy has established monthly data points that we use to identify trends, compare with other homes, or track progress. We graph and analyze multiple sets of data around antibiotics. As an example, the pharmacy can look at all antibiotic systems for urinary tract infections to see if the prescribers are using broad spectrum antibiotics when there may be a more appropriate choice. The graph before you is a sample graph of what we review each month to analyze how many antibiotic dispenses the pharmacy is fulfilling by medication. A graph such as this can be more specific to a particular facility or diagnosis. When data like this is produced, it can be shared with nursing, prescribers, and their extenders to review and find trends. In order to track progress, you need to develop a benchmark. The formula we use for tracking monthly antibiotic therapy usage is the following. 
we take the monthly number of antibiotic therapies, divide that by the monthly number of total patient days times 1,000. Patient days are calculated by totaling the monthly census of active resident days for a given facility. This will be obtained by collaborating with the nursing facility's business office or finance department, who will share that data with the pharmacy. This equation will be used for total antibiotics dispensed for an entire facility or for specific diagnosis, such as pneumonia or genetic tract infection. The graph before you is a useful example of how to establish a monthly measure for comparison between facilities. One challenge you may face in data gathering is if your facility works with multiple pharmacies. You will want to pull data from one source, ideally an EMR that contains antibiotic information on all residents, regardless of which pharmacy dispenses medication. And with that, I'll turn it back to my colleague, Neil Farwell. All right, so I'm talking about optimization in real time. The goals are to collect, calculate, analyze, communicate, and de-escalate. De-escalation means, when possible, <clears throat> changing a patient's treatment to the narrow, narrow spectrum of activity, which is still effective against the infection. The key driver behind this is our EMR, which allows us to collect information, such as height, weight, also labs such as serum creatinine of patients. Our EMR pulls in lab data and we can view culture and sensitivities which aid in de-escalation. An example of de-escalation could be a patient on Levitin switching to a narrower spectrum antibiotic such as amoxicillin when the culture and sensitivity report supports the change. The culture and sensitivity lab are the key driver in de-escalating patients to a narrower spectrum therapeutic medication. Finally, our goal is to communicate recommendations to nursing and physicians in order to ensure optimization of antibiotic therapy. This, is, this type of process has shown better outcomes for patients. We also use our EMR to track statistics on how many patients we have reviewed and the number of recommendations and interventions that we make. That being said, it would be difficult to pull together all of this information without a customizable EMR. With all this information, we can analyze medications that may, that may require real adjustment by calculating real function. Document and intervene on allergy contraindications as well as review the errors to the treatment algorithm. Now, we'll, now I will turn it back to, over to Donna Baker. Thank you, Dan. So our next steps as we think about our antibiotic future program, we need to stay uh, informed and continue to stay informed with regulatory changes and expectations and to, uh, quite frankly, just keep up with them. Um, they are coming very fast. So uh, we will continue also to use the plan to check back model um, in that process. Continue to educate providers, staff, residents, and families on antibiotic use and the stewardship program ongoing uh, and to be sure that the to plan for turnover and how the staff will be integrated so you can keep the momentum and keep moving forward. Continue to monitor and evaluate our program overall and the progress and outcomes, and again, we'll modify our plan as necessary uh, in using that checklist uh, from the CDC to do so. So in closing, um, I've included my uh, contact information um, and uh, also um, uh, Neil and uh, Rob, um, and also uh, I can also forward them any sort of information uh, with this contact information as well. I apologize for the not on the slide. Um, but I just wanted to thank you all. Okay, hey, folks, at this point, I think we're about 10 minutes over, and so we don't have a lot of time for questions and answers, but I know that uh, Sarah um, has been responding on uh, areas to download a copy of the presentation, and I think please feel free to reach out to your state QIO representative, and we can absolutely make the connection between any of the speakers today um, or any of the resources we've identified, including your uh, state um, public health organizations or um, any of the kind of uh, super users, I guess I'd call them, that have really um, focused on creating an antibiotic stewardship program uh, to be able to comply with the rules of participation.
I know um, I think I'm going to turn it over to Morgan at this point and do some final thoughts. Thanks, Danielle. Um, for anybody listening on the phone, I did want to mention that if you want to go ahead and put a question into chat right now, we can follow up with our speakers to get any of those questions answered. So since we couldn't do a live question and answer session, if you at least put your questions in chat, we can um, get them addressed and then follow up with you after. Um, Danielle, if you can go to the next slide. So we have a few upcoming events. Um, Invitations have gone out for that. Hopefully you've seen it in WIG or the events um, newsletter that we sent out, um, as well as some specific emails for those events. But um, we've got getting to the root falls, uh, or the root cause of the resident falls with Sue Ann Gilderman coming up next week. And then the following week, we've got the Assessing and Managing Pain Seminar with Carol Curtis. Um, next slide. So last um, webinar, we did a Facebook challenge to encourage people to like us on Facebook, and the winner of the two tickets to the um, pain seminar in Massachusetts is Jennifer Nichols. So we will be reaching out to Jennifer if she's not on the line right now. Um, so we, again, if you go to the next slide, we want to encourage everyone to like us on Facebook um, where you can find information about upcoming events um, and things like that. I think that's it for the slides, but as you close out of today's webinar, the evaluation will automatically pop up on your computer. So if you could fill that out, we'd greatly appreciate it. If you don't have time to fill it out right now or sharing a computer with somebody else, you will receive an email tomorrow containing a link to the evaluation as well as a link to our event webpage. Um, on that event webpage, you'll be able to find the PowerPoint, which I know Sarah has put the link in chat. I think Doreen did at the beginning as well. Um, and in the next few business days, we'll also add the recording and transcripts to that um, <coughs> web link. So, again, thank you, everyone, for joining. Thank you to all of our presenters. Um, that was a wealth of knowledge. And um, we look forward to seeing you guys at one of our in-person events or on our next webinar. Um, in October. So keep those questions coming into chat. Um, we'll leave that open for a few more minutes. But other than that, thank you everyone for joining and have a great day. The leader has disconnected. The conference will be terminated in five minutes.